So welcome everybody uh, to our conversation with Stanford professor Mark Jacobson. My name is Tanette DeVoe and I'm with uh, Sierra Club Canada's Beyond Coal campaign. Um, this campaign is based in Atlantic Canada. I live in Chibuktuk, uh, also known as Halifax, in the unceded territory known as Mi'kmaq. Uh, Chibuktuk is a Mi'kmaq word meaning great harbor. And this harbor once had plenty of gray seals and even Atlantic walruses. And it had a thriving Mi'kmaq community with complex social and political structures. European invaders and colonial settlers have brought a lot of suffering to the Mi'kmaq people and to the land, the wildlife, air and water. And as a descendant of colonial settlers, I hope to help set things right as a friend, ally and co-conspirator with the Mi'kmaq. So, um, Mark, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I'll offer uh, a brief introduction. Um, Mark Jacobson is a professor of civil engineering at Stanford University, where he is the director of the atmosphere and energy program. He has written extensively on how to transition to 100% wind, water, and solar in all energy sectors, as well as on electricity grid reliability under those scenarios. In June of this year, his uh, latest co-authored report was published, the title of which is Low Cost Solutions to Global Warming, Air Pollution, and energy and security for 145 countries. And Canada is one of those countries discussed in the report. So um, there's a lot more uh, I could say about Mark Jacobson. His, um, his CV is really a mile long and I think Lindsay's gonna put uh, a link in the chat if you want to learn more about um, Mark Jacobson's background and work. Um, I'm joined tonight by many co-hosts representing various organizations involved in climate action and climate justice, and I'll be introducing them as they bring forward questions uh, this evening. So we have a lot of uh, questions for you, Mark, and so uh, we're going to jump in. <laughs> Okay. Thank okay. Um, so I'm going to start it off um, with a, a, a little flashback. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I met with Mark Slidebottom, who's the chief, who was the chief operating officer for Nova Scotia Power, uh, along with his his boss, the CEO Peter Gregg. And at one point in the meeting. Uh, Mark Sidebottom began explaining to me and my colleagues that because the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, the company had to maintain, has to maintain its baseload uh, energy supply, which in Nova Scotia currently comes primarily from coal. Now today, Mr. Sidebottom is actually the chief clean energy officer for Nova Scotia Power, a private utility monopoly. So my question for you, Mark, is what do you say to Mr. Sidebottom and all the other chief operating officers and CEOs of power utilities uh, that are saying, essentially, you're dreaming or the technology isn't quite there yet? Thank you. Um, well, I would say Canada has enough resource to power itself entirely with wind and water and solar power. I'll define what that is in a minute, uh, many times over. And well, wind, we're talking about onshore and offshore wind. Solar would be solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants primarily, and some solar heat. 
and water includes primarily hydroelectric power, but also geothermal electricity and heat in, in our categories, and then tiny amounts of tidal wave power. And you know, we, we, we've developed a plan for a 100% wind water solar Canada. And that plan involves, it's gonna be about 55% wind. So it's mostly onshore, but also offshore wind, maybe about 15% solar and about a quarter hydroelectric power. And all that hydroelectric power already exists. And I mentioned that because, you know, another way to, you really, when you're trying to match power demand with supply, it, you don't need baseload. Baseload is a flat supply of energy and the demand for energy is not flat, it's variable. The key is to match your variable supply like wind and solar with demand. And one way you do that is with hydroelectric power, which you can turn on and off quite easily. But there are other ways to do this as well. And so in fact, when we transition to 100% wind, water, and solar, we're really doing it for all energy purposes. So that's, we're really transitioning transportation as well to electricity. And so we'd have battery electric vehicles, some hydrogen fuel cell vehicles for long distance transport, like long distance aircraft, ships, trains, and some trucks. And, trans and then buildings, we instead of using natural gas or wood to heat buildings, uh, we would use electric heat pumps primarily, where the electricity comes from wind, water, and solar. And that's for air and water heating for buildings. It'd be some district heating. And for industry, we'd electrify industry as well. And I mentioned this because when you electrify all energy sectors, you, you produce what are, or you create what are called flexible, more flexible loads. So when you have to turn the lights on at any time of the day, that's called an inflexible load. You, you need the electricity right away. But when you have a battery electric vehicle, you don't have a wind turbine connected to the car, you have a battery. And so you can charge that battery any time of day or night. Same thing with water heating in buildings. You have a water tank, so you don't need to you know, charge, heat that water when the sun is shining, or, or sorry, when the, you don't need to heat the water, let's say when the um, sun is not shining, you, you can wait till the sun is shining or the wind is blowing and store that heat. And so you have what are called flexible loads, and that makes it easier to match power demand with supply. So really, there are four ways to match power demand with supply in a 100% renewable energy grid. Now, one is over generation, where you build more generators than you need. Uh, the second is more storage. And there's not only hydroelectric power is basically a big battery, so that's one type of storage. Another type of existing storage is pumped hydroelectric power. When you have extra electricity, like you do when you have wind and solar, you use that extra electricity to push water up a hill. And then when, when you need that electricity, you let the water come down a hill and the motor that pushed the water up the hill runs in reverse as a generator to generate electricity in that case. Batteries is, are a third type of electricity storage. They're also what are called flywheels. There's compressed air storage. There's gravitational storage with solid masses. These are all existing technologies, although the latter ones are and not developed so significantly yet. And the cost of batteries is coming down so much that, I mean, California already has three gigawatts of batteries in place. And that's, you know, compared to its average grid peak power, well, the average power of the grid is around 21 gigawatts, the peak power is up to 52. But, you know, it's three is, is one seventh, the one seventh the average power of California's grid is already, you have batteries, which can be turned on and off instantaneously to meet, meet power demand. So anyway, storage is one type of, is another way to match power demand with supply. Uh, the third is interconnecting through uh, transmission lines, a geographically dispersed wind and solar, for example. So when the wind is not blowing in one place, it's often blowing somewhere else. Same with solar and even wind and solar when when you don't have wind, often you have sunlight. When you don't have sunlight, you often have wind. In fact, we found that when you interconnect over large geographic regions, wind alone, you can convert pretty much completely intermittent power to one that has about 40% of the reliability of a coal-fired power plant. So geographically interconnecting wind and solar. The fourth way is through what's called demand response, where utilities give people incentives not to use electricity at certain times of the day, financial incentives, like having di different rates of electricity at different times of the day. You're therefore changing the demand for <clears throat> electricity. 
For example, a few weeks ago when uh, California suffered a, a heat wave uh, on the hottest day of the year, the governor actually asked, didn't even pay people, just asked people not to use electricity between or late in the afternoon and early evening. And all of a sudden, soon, soon after the request, the demand for electricity dropped and there was no blackout. Even though that day we had the highest electricity demand in the state's history, it's like 53 gigawatts, there was no blackout on the grid and we had the most penetration of renewables ever on the grid. Uh, and so demand response works. If you either ask people or give people incentives not to use electricity, that works. So combining those four ways, you can keep the grid stable. In fact, there are 10 countries of the world that have 100% uh, wind, water, solar, electricity right now. They're all fairly small countries and they're mostly dominated by hydropower, uh, but some have wind and geothermal uh, and some have some solar as well. Uh, so it's definitely possible to keep the grid stable with 100% clean renewable electricity and storage for everything. All right, well, we, we may have to give uh, some of these CEOs uh, uh, your phone number uh, because it's a tough sell, you know? And one of the other um, arguments that I hear in these um, meetings is that the demand for electricity is, is going to increase and it's going to be a challenge to keep up with um, you know, if we electrify everything, for example. So how do you meet that increasing demand for electricity once we trade in, um, you know, uh, combustion vehicles for um, battery operated ones and so on? Well, yeah, we will have a higher electricity demand, but our overall energy demand will go down about 57%. Uh, and this is because an electric system is much more efficient than a fossil fuel system. In fact, in Canada, uh, our energy requirements will go down 62%. So in other words, let's say right now you have 100 units of all energy being used. Uh, on average in the world, about 20, 21 units of that 100 units is electricity. And so, you know, 78, 79, percent of all energy right now is not electricity. It's, it's, it's a energy in gasoline, it's energy, this is, we're talking about end use energy. So energy in gasoline, energy in natural gas, energy in uh, coal burn for heat, for example, or biomass. Most energy is not electricity right now, only about 20, well, 21 to 22 percent is. So if we electrify all energy, in other words, if we electrify transportation, buildings and industry, which are the primary sectors, uh, in Canada, our energy demand goes down from 100 units down to 38 units. So we have much less energy demand, but all those all 38 units in Canada will be electricity or almost all units. There'll be some direct heat. Let's we'll just call it 38 units will be electricity. So yeah, we'll double, almost double the electricity demand in Canada, but our total energy demand goes down 62%. So it's actually... In, so yeah, we will need more electricity infrastructure, more transmission lines for sure, but uh, we need less energy infrastructure. We don't need any pipelines. I mean, right now there are millions of miles of pipelines in the US I mean, the fossil fuel industry, I'll just, I know the numbers for the US, well, North America, there are 50,000 new oil and gas wells drilled every year. And there are 1.3 million active oil and gas wells in the US alone and 3.2 million abandoned ones. Tw uh, worldwide, there are about 29 million abandoned oil and gas wells. In the US, there are millions of miles of pipeline, there's storage facilities, there's gas stations. The fossil fuel industry takes up 1.3% of all US land area. So we will eliminate the whole entire fossil fuel infrastructure. And if we, if we transition to 100% renewables, and that will free up a lot of land and free up, we don't need pipelines for gas at all. And so there, but we will need more uh, transmission lines or to, and that can be accomplished largely by strengthening existing lines or making them you know, bigger lines. Sure. Uh, but we will need less overall infrastructure, but we will need some different infrastructure compared with today. Sure. And, you know, I'll be honest, uh, the, the, the idea that, 
Electricity only makes up 20 to 25% of our energy use for me anyway, it's kind of mind boggling because that's what I think of when I think of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, I think of electricity and what we're using and obviously cars as well. But um, yeah, I think um, a lot of us who don't uh, come from that science background um, uh, find it surprising that um, this huge footprint that we don't really understand because we're not doesn't show up on our bills every month or whatever. Right, like industry has on the order of forty percent of all uh, energy, all energy use, and this is end use energy, what people actually use, not the raw fuels. Mm. But forty percent of what people actually use is from industry. There's a lot from buildings like natural gas and wood and buildings, gasoline and diesel fuel for transportation. Those make up you know, up to almost 80% of end use energy. Electricity is only on the order of 20 to 22%. Okay. And that, but that will change. We'll double that amount um, of sure. electricity, but reduce the, we'll eliminate all the other types of energy. Yeah, okay. Great. Um, so I'd like to call on uh, one of our um, co-hosts, uh, Stephen Thomas. Stephen, if you're if you're there, I'm going to ask you to um, address your question to uh, Mark J. Mark. And uh, Stephen Thomas is with the David Suzuki Foundation. And uh, he's co-author of a report um, on how to get uh, Canada to 100% renewables um, by 2035. So Stephen, welcome. Hey folks, and uh, and hey Mark, it's uh, great to hear from you. Uh, really, uh, really respect the work that you do, and it makes the work we do everywhere a little bit easier. Um, those of us Likewise. working on, I appreciate that. Uh, those of us uh, working on this in, in Canada are, are really keenly focused on the, the clean electricity regulations that we're putting forward right now for 2035. Um, and already we're thinking or, or we're hearing from, uh, from government and from industry that we need to kick that can further down the road past 2035. Um, as we're keenly focused on 100% renewables by 2035, uh, my question for you is, is what do we lose when we kick that can down the road? Um, the dead end pathways and the, uh, um, uh, the, the the emissions that continue to come out um, as we uh, as we go for 2050 targets and so on for for the rest of the economy. Um, uh, yeah, we would love your insights on that. Appreciate it. Yeah, great question. Um, well, so I'm looking at this from an air pollution, a climate, and a, an energy security point of view. Worldwide, seven million people die from air pollution each year. And in Canada, that's, you know, it's on the order of 4,000 or so, so it's not so significant as other countries. But on a worldwide scale, this is a very important issue. And global warming is a growing issue. We need to solve, well, 80% of the global warming problem by 2030 and 100% ideally by 2035, but no later, certainly no later than 2050. In energy security, we can see the problems facing us right now. I mean, not only, uh, well, limitations in fossil fuels, holdups um, cause energy price instability. So prices go up and that results in social, economic and political instability. But we also have energy and energy insecurity due to the fact we have lots of centralized power plants and when one goes down, that takes down a whole portion of the grid as opposed to decentralized wind and solar, which are more difficult to take down. Uh, we also have energy insecurity due to a political issues like just the fact that importing fuels can create problem problems as we, as we see in Europe. Uh, how, because, you know, if one country controls the energy of another country, they can use it for blackmail or there can be even internally inside of a country, there can be a labor, a labor dispute or something that can hold up energy uh, transfers. Anyway, we want to solve all these problems simultaneously. And because we're trying to solve all that simultaneously, you know, we really need to eliminate these pollutants immediately. I mean, especially because of the deaths that are occurring each year, 7 million people die each year. So this is why we want to solve this problem immediately, not 15, 20 years from now. 
and we need to and to do this we really need to reshape the discussion this is not a a decarbonization issue this is an elimination of emissions issue where all emissions include carbon and all air pollutants we're not just focusing on carbon we're focusing on all emissions so this re and there's a specific reason for this not only because we want to stop air pollution but when we focus on carbon we allow the fossil fuel industry to come up with these fake technologies like carbon capture, direct air capture, blue hydrogen that keep them in business and don't do anything for air pollution, actually increase air pollution because you need more energy up to, you know, like usually 30% more energy at least to run this, run these equipment, equipment uh, or machines. And you, you don't reduce any fossil fuels, you actually increase the mining 30% of the fossil fuels. And there's no proof that you're actually saving any carbon because it, most 75% of all carbon dioxide that is captured today is used for enhanced oil recovery. And that process releases 40% of the captured CO2 right back to the air. And who knows if the rest of the CO2 is captured or not, or stay, stays under the ground. And plus that results in more oil coming out of the ground. So more oil burned and more pollution, more CO2 emissions. So there, we really need, to not only focus on addressing these issues as fast as possible, and so 20, 80% by 2030 at least, and ideally 100% by 2035 across all energy sectors, but we really need to focus on the technologies that work and start uh, questioning and not, not spending money on technologies that we know are not going to work and that will not simultaneously reduce air pollution and energy insecurity. Uh, and carbon emissions. And yeah, this is why yeah, we want to focus on clean renewable energy and storage, not on just decarbonization, not on, and not on um, carbon capture, direct air capture, blue hydrogen, by the way, blue hydrogen is different from what's called green hydrogen. Green hydrogen is hydrogen produced from clean renewable electricity. Blue hydrogen is produced from natural gas, but with carbon capture added to that. And that has the same problems as any other carbon capture, plus it allows methane to leak during the mining and none of that's captured uh, and it results in air pollution. So it's just, you know, it's just a complete mess. This, uh, I'm going to uh, jump in, Mark, because um, this is a, an opportunity to talk a little bit about natural gas uh, or as we sometimes call it, fossil gas or fracked gas. Um, I'm going to invite Angela Bishop. Uh, she's with the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. Angela, if you want to um, ask your question, uh, because I know uh, you and folks uh, with Ontario Clean Air Alliance are working really hard on um, getting gas uh, power plants um, shut down and um, transition to clean energy. Um, I'm just going to ask Angela if uh, they can name themselves uh, okay. by their name because I can't sure. find them in the attendees to okay. bring them up as a panelist. Sure, sure. Um, well, I'm going to read um, her question um, while you look for it. Um, so her question was, we hear a lot about how gas fire generation is the best way to deal with peak electricity demand. And so her question was, what's your view on that? Using gas to deal with peak electricity demand? Yeah. Yeah, so sure, that works, but do we want it to, do we need it? No, do we want it? No. Um, Because <laughs> uh, you can do the same, you can do the exact same thing, but better with hydroelectric power, pumped hydroelectric power batteries, these all accomplish the same thing better and faster. In fact, you know, the response time of batteries is instantaneous. You know, the response time of natural gas is much slower. It's like, uh, it's like on um, 20% per minute. So it can take five, up to five minutes for a natural gas uh, turbine to be ramp ramped up fast enough to provide 100% backing power where it takes a millisecond for a battery. For hydropower, it takes 15 seconds for 100% power. So both hydropower and batteries 
are much more efficient than natural gas at providing backup power. And in Canada, you have a lot of hydropower. And there's, yeah, there's plenty. It's a lot of it's not used right now for peaking. It's used more for baselip. But as I mentioned earlier, batteries are becoming cheaper and they're being implemented worldwide, not only in California, where I mentioned we already have three gigawatts of batteries. Three gigawatts is like three, four nuclear power plants uh, worth of batteries in terms of its peak power. And in South Australia, similar, there's a lot of batteries that are saving a lot of money because of the fast ramp rate of the batteries. And because we have, as I mentioned, there are many other ways now to provide, uh, to, pro pro to actually match power demand with supply. There's over-generation of renewables, there's interconnecting through the transmission grid, there's storage, there's demand response. Demand response is actually the cheapest way to uh, help with peaking power uh, in fact, you know, we have, we've had demand response in California for many years where I just, like I have an electric house, electric cars, uh, electric heat pumps, I generate my own solar and I sell electricity back to the grid. But I also, uh, you know, at night, let's say, or sometimes in winter when I don't have enough, enough electricity, I'll use grid electricity. But on average over the year, I send 20% more electricity than I need back to the grid. Uh, back to the grid. So I overgenerate over the year. But there are three rates. So one rate, the lowest rate is between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. The highest rate is generally between 3 p.m. and 9 p.m. And there's a middle rate for all other hours. So for charging an electric car, it's you're incentivized because in summer, that difference between the peak, the high rate and the low rate is a factor of five between 55 cents a kilowatt hour versus 11 cents a kilowatt hour. That's a factor of five difference. So people are incentivized strongly to charge their electric cars at night and not to use electricity when we have peak time of demand, which is in the late afternoon. And that helps to prevent blackouts on the grid. Now, when we go to much more solar on the grid, we'll find that it's actually more efficient to charge electric cars during the day. But you know, right now we have a lot of solar, but not enough that you need to change that time. But my point is, is that that's a way to keep the grid stable by charging different electricity rates at different times of the day, in addition to more storage and using hydropower, more hydropower for peaking rather than baseload, and also interconnecting geographically dispersed renewables and oversizing them. Yeah. Um, you know, the challenge, of course, is that um, everywhere we're dealing with utility uh, monopolies, and they're not so happy to allow uh, homeowners or or businesses to put solar installations, for example, on their roofs and sell that back to the grid. Um, so, yeah, in, it's and it's interesting. We have very little in in certainly in in the province where I live. Uh, we have very little insight into what time of day uh, would be more costly or would have peak, um, you know, demand. So we have no uh, ability to uh, self-regulate. Um, right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'll say, well, the utilities know when the peak time of electricity use is during the day. So, I mean, let's say around here, it's generally in the late afternoon, early evening. Mm -hmm. So that's when they, you know, they peg the highest electricity price. And there are a lot of places though that, yeah, they have this constant electricity price all day, but that does not give anybody incentive to save electricity at, at the key time of the day. But utilities know when people are using electricity, so they should be able to um, set these rates for different times of the day. Yeah. And in terms of rooftop solar, yeah, that's the same thing in California. I and mean, now the utilities are trying to tax rooftop solar because they think they're claiming it's cutting into their business revenues. But in fact, if you think about it, as I mentioned, we're basically going to double the electricity demand as we electrify everything. And we'll reduce all energy over 60%, but we'll double the electricity. So even if a large portion of, of buildings put rooftop solar, and even if the utilities don't get any of that money, they're still going to have far more electricity uh, sales in the future. Uh, than they do today because we're going to have to increase electricity usage significantly. So they have nothing to complain about. And yeah, mm -hmm. they're just really just trying to, 
take as much money as possible. There's no there's no justification whatsoever for yeah. taxing rooftop solar or trying to prevent it. Uh, it's you know that only hurts society as a whole. It hurts consumers uh, and it hurts the public in terms of health and climate problems and energy security problems that we face. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no arguments from me. Um, <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna see if uh, Susan O'Donnell would like to go next. Uh, Susan is with the Coalition for Responsible Energy Development in New Brunswick, uh, known as CRED NB. Susan, are you there? We didn't- uh... I don't see Susan either. <laughs> in the... We didn't uh, do a test run for this sort of approach. Okay, um, I'm going to uh, offer Susan's question then. Um, so in New Brunswick, uh, they're betting big on small modular nuclear reactors as a central element for the province's climate action plan. And uh, New Brunswick Power is aiming to close our only coal-fired energy plant by 2030, which is when all of uh, the coal-fired plants in Canada are required to be uh, phased out. And uh, New Brunswick Power intends to replace coal-fired energy, that plant, uh, with small modular nuclear reactors by 2030. So I'm I'm chuckling because uh, yeah her her question is what are your thoughts on this it's like do you believe in unicorns I don't know Mark well I'm just surprised that you know smart people can't learn from past mistakes mm. you know, and continue to propose to do things that we know are not going to work it work efficiently that is or even maybe work at all yeah I mean small modular reactors are going to be just as expensive or more expensive than large reactors right now, which are have a capital cost of about 15 times that of new wind or solar. So specifically, for example, let's first talk about large reactors. Uh, in Georgia, there are two reactors being built, the only two in the US, and they are between 17 to 18 years now between planning and operation. So, they had they started 17, 18 years ago because there are two of them. They were being planned, and it, they still are not available for use yet. So these are the small modular nuclear. No, no, these are large ones. So I'm first oh, talking okay. about the large ones. Then I'll, then I'll go yeah, to the yeah, small sure, ones. sure. But I mean, so far they've laid a sidewalk from Miami to Seattle of concrete, so that the emissions of that have gone into the air, and not a single kilowatt hour has been generated, and it's cost 34 billion dollars for mm. two point two or three gigawatts. So that works out to over $15 a watt. And compared with new onshore wind or new utility solar is $1 a watt. The overall cost of energy is going to result in about seven to eight times that of wind or solar. So you and then takes for wind or solar to be put up, it takes one to three years. So we're talking about, you know, uh, seven, 15 to 17 years longer and you know, seven to eight times the cost per unit energy to get the same power. And so if you plan a new large, and this is the same, there are plants in Europe, there's Flamenville, France, there's Hinkley in England, there's the Okuloto plant in Finland. There are several pl plants that are similar. They're all taking longer and costing huge amounts. And so it just makes no sense financially or wait, we need to solve 80% of the problem in eight years. And here we have nuclear reactors that take 17 to, well, really the average is 15 to 21 years between planning and operation. So they, they have no hope. These large reactors have absolutely no hope of helping with the climate problem. In fact, today there's less nuclear, nuclear production of electricity than in 2006. Just last Friday, another nuclear reactor in Belgium shut down permanently. And so there's less, just less and less. So nuclear is not helping to solve the problem. So what's this? So the nuclear industry realizes, well, people are finally realizing how useless this technology is for helping to solve the climate problem going forward. And so they have shifted to talk about these small modular reactors. Well, the small modular reactors, before the large reactors, we were building small reactors 
And the reason we switch to large reactors is due to economies of scale, because it's much cheaper to build large reactors than small reactors. But now they forgot about that. And now they're going back to the small reactors. But even the ones that are being built, they're already saying they're not going to be ready until 2030. And that's just a claim, because the nuclear industry always claims they're going to be fast and cheap. But so that's just the start. And there's no guarantee it'll be 2030, it'd probably be 2035. And for all we know, and the cost will probably be three, four times higher for all we know. There's no evidence that there, it's gonna be cheaper. In fact, it's, the evidence is it'll be more expensive because there are issues associated with small reactors that cause them to be more expensive because of the contamination of the actual equipment materials in the reactors themselves. But then on top of that, they don't get rid of the problems we have. In fact, some of them are worse. Nuclear weapons proliferation is the, one of the largest problems associated with, with uh, nuclear energy. Five countries of the world have secretly developed weapons under the guise of civilian nuclear energy programs. What are these small re reactors? Well, they can be shipped all over the world easily. And as a result, it's possible to, uh, for countries then to import uranium under the guise of civilian nuclear energy, just like Iran has done, and centrifuge it and refine it to develop uh, weapons grade uranium or to harvest plutonium, which is even easier to produce weapons from. And so this is more of a problem. And what about meltdown risk? Well, there are just so many different models, models of these small modular reactors. We don't know what the meltdown risk is of each one. There's waste, you're still gonna have waste. And if you don't have waste, it's because they refine the uranium, uranium more uh, Re, so reprocess it for reprocessing for breeder reactors, but those are, have more weapons grade uranium. So that's a problem. You still need the uranium from underground mines, a lot of underground mines, and then you have uranium underground mining lung cancer risk from radon, which is associated with uranium mining. So you have all these peripheral problems, plus costs, plus delays. You know, it, why are these people talking about small modular reactors that may or may not be available in eight to 10 years, when we have today, we have wind, we have solar, we have batteries, we have uh, pumped hydro, we have uh, electric vehicles, we have heat pumps. We need to implement, deploy, deploy, deploy things as fast as possible. Not, we don't need miracle technologies. We need existing technologies that can be deployed as fast as possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is a little bit related to a question I'm gonna ask Brenna Walsh to bring you. Um, so Brenna is with the Ecology Action uh, Center here in um, Chibuktuk or Halifax, um, and it concerns um, green energy uh, or green green energy, green hydrogen. Uh, it's been uh, a very hot topic in um, on our on our coast this uh, past month or so. Hey, Brenna. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, so I just want to ask about, not, am I, are you able to hear me? Tana? You're kind of cutting in and out, actually. I've actually been having a Zoom issue. So maybe if you could answer the, ask the question. So sure. thanks very much for the opportunity. Okay. All right. So Brenna's question was, um, there's been a lot of conversation locally about hydrogen and a lot of the conversation is about using onshore or offshore wind to convert to hydrogen for export. Uh, can you speak on the effective uses or times to generate hydrogen? For example, could effective uses in Canada be expanded if more interties between regions were built into our grid. And maybe I'll just preface that too by saying that, uh, so the announcements that have happened uh, just recently, both in Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, are all about these massive um, wind uh, developments. Um, one is on land, on shore, in, um, in an area of Newfoundland. Um, and they want like 164 turbines on this little peninsula as part of phase one. And that's intended for export as green hydrogen. And in Nova Scotia, um, there are a few plans involving, I think 
largely offshore and some onshore. And again, it's all about how much can we ship to Europe because we have to help with the situation with Ukraine. Like, okay. Yeah. Um, well, so I'll address each of these components. Well, first I'll address green hydrogen and second, what are the uses of the green hydrogen? And what are the most, then third, what are the most efficient uses of production versus using it uh, to help balance a grid? Um, well, first, green hydrogen is hydrogen produced from electricity that's green electricity, namely wind, water, solar, we'll call it that. And so that's the only way we actually advocate for using hydrogen or producing hydrogen is green hydrogen. So not brown hydrogen, which is steamer forming of natural gas or uh, any other type of natural gas production of hydrogen, not blue hydrogen, which is, is basically brown hydrogen plus carbon capture, not other types of hydrogen from fossil fuels. Um, second, what are the applications of hydrogen? Well, the ones that are useful are for long distance transport, like long distance aircraft, meaning 1500 kilometers or longer, long distance ships, you know, long distance trains and trucks. For passenger vehicles, however, it's much more efficient to have battery electric vehicles because even though you can make green hydrogen just almost as clean as battery electric vehicle, because the only emissions coming out of a hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle is water vapor, it's you need about three times the number of wind turbines or two and a half to three times the number of wind turbines to drive an electric passenger vehicle the same distance as a battery electric passenger vehicle. So it's just not that efficient because you just have more efficiency losses in producing and consuming the hydrogen for uh, in a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. However, the heavier and longer distance that a vehicle goes, uh, the more you end up, the battery electric vehicle becomes less efficient because it's just carrying around more batteries to go that extra distance and you're just using energy to carry around the battery. So at some point, the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles become more efficient because of hydrogen storage is, is weighs less than battery storage past a certain point. And so that's why long distance trucks, namely trucks that are like semi trucks going, uh, you know, a thousand kilometers, maybe 1100 kilometers or longer, it's more efficient to have uh, hydrogen fuel cell electric, shorter distance, more efficient to have battery electric, battery electric. Same with aircraft, less than 1500 kilometers, battery electric's more efficient, more, longer than 1500 kilometers, hydrogen fuel cell is more efficient. In any case, so that's one application. A second application is steel production. You know, right now steel is produced from pure iron, but you get the pure iron, taking iron ore and purifying it to iron, pure iron, by trying to removing the oxygen. And you remove the oxygen right now by combining it with carbon to make carbon dioxide that gets released to the air. So there's a lot of carbon dioxide during steel production, but instead you can react iron ore with hydrogen and you'll end up getting uh, water and you can take the oxygen out that way. And that purifies iron without any carbon, especially if it's green hydrogen. And in fact, there's a steel plant in uh, Sweden now that does that. And this process is you can remove 98% of all carbon emissions from steel just with the green hydrogen process. And they've done that in Sweden. Now, I think all the plants in Sweden or steel plants are gonna be converted because this first demo plant has been found to be so efficient. A third application is ammonia. I mean, ammonia right now is already produced from hydrogen, but it's, it's from gray hydrogen mostly. And so we just switched that to green hydrogen. So those are the three main applications that hydrogen are, is useful for long distance transport, steel production, ammonia production. One more could be remote microgrids combined electricity and heat. Because when you use, you know, in a remote microgrid, you're far from, you know, you're not connected to the grid. Let's say you're far north in the snow. And I mean, you could use batteries for both electricity and heat, but, uh, you know, if you have to store energy for, several weeks, you either need a lot of batteries uh, or you need storage tanks. And at some point storage tanks from hydrogen are more efficient. But anyway, when you run hydrogen through a fuel cell, you can generate both electricity and heat. And if you capture that heat, you can use that heat in the microgrid. But hydrogen is not very useful for stationary electricity storage for grids. And 
well, I mean, you can do, you can do it, use it for grid electricity, grid electricity. But again, batteries are more efficient if you're just using the hydrogen fuel cells uh, for electricity storage because just the energy required to produce the hydrogen, compress it, and store it, and then use it in a fuel cell. Uh, those efficiencies, when you add them up, uh, it's much less efficient to do that than just to run electricity into a battery and out of a battery. So you just save a lot more energy by using batteries for stationary electricity storage. Uh, okay, so you don't want to use hydrogen either for passenger vehicles, stationary electricity storage, and third, you don't want to use it for building heat. And this is what a lot of the natural gas industry is proposing is to use hydrogen to burn it instead of natural gas or with natural gas, mix it with natural gas and pipelines, send it to buildings and burn it. That's completely inefficient. It's much more efficient to use electric heat pumps, which use one fourth the energy is even natural gas heaters uh, and it also provide air conditioning and also are, are just, just so much more efficient. So uh, whether or not, okay, so the question is whether you should use these wind farms for hydrogen production. Well, so actually I looked at this uh, issue recently in a lot of detail and when you combine hydrogen production for any of these purposes I mentioned, transport, long distance transport, ammonia or steel, and you use extra excess electricity from wind or solar, let's say you have 100% wind, water, solar grid, you're gonna have hours of the year where you have too much electricity, and then you'll have a lot of hours where you don't have enough electricity, and then you'll have hours where you have just enough. So when you have too much electricity, there are three things you can do with it. You can just store the electricity in batteries. You can convert that electricity to heat and store the heat, or you can produce hydrogen. So if you produce hydrogen with some of that excess electricity, you can actually cheapen the, uh, you can reduce the cost of keeping the grid stable. Uh, because let's say let's say you didn't have any of those methods right now. If you have 100% renewable grid, when you have extra electricity, it just gets wasted, right? So nothing, it's not used for anything, and so the cost of electricity goes up. But if you use it that extra electricity, some of it for hydrogen production, uh, then you're basically that's free electricity that would otherwise have been wasted. So you can reduce the cost of producing that hydrogen. And so I've calculated that it's about you know if you actually use produce hydrogen about 30% of the hours of the year, which corresponds to a portion of, well, anywhere from 15 to 30%. So it's not even a majority, 15 to 30% of the hours of the year, which is some of the hours that you have excess electricity, you're actually, re you can reduce the overall cost of energy quite a bit compared mm -hmm. with just wasting that electricity. So there is an advantage of combining hydrogen with wind, but you don't want to do it 24 seven. Sure. You want to use that wind primarily for um, generating grid electricity for the community, and you'd use right. it to produce hydrogen basically when you have too much of it. Okay. And and I'm hearing, you know, as far as I know, we're not, we don't have jumbo jets that can fly on green hydrogen yet. Or, or not, other. No, we don't. Yeah, there are some small planes that are flying on, okay. on green hydrogen. And there are, there's a, as I mentioned, steel and ammonia is already produced from hydrogen. So we could use the hydrogen mostly for ammonia today. Right, okay. All right. Well, it does sound though that um, the projects that are underway um, are intended to, I mean, they're, they're talking about it as a replacement for Russian gas. Yeah, well, there, um, so, so yeah, there is a concern there because right now, um, there's a yeah natural gas storage, but in Europe during the winter, they use natural gas primarily for heating. Yes, so they yes. may be talking about converting this hydrogen and sending it to Europe for heating, which is not an efficient use of hydrogen, first of all, to transport it that long distance and then use it for heating right. rather than to build heat pumps and install right. heat pumps. And yeah. yeah, it's just not an efficient use of hydrogen. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't be the first time we've done something inefficient here uh, north of your border. Um, okay, I'm going to ask uh, Olivia Dimick. Sorry, Olivia, if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Uh, I'm going to ask her to come on. Uh, she's with the Climate Caucus, and the Climate Caucus is um, a national network of, uh, of municipal leaders, so elected municipal leaders who want to 
um, green their cities and do more in terms of climate action and so on. And I'm really inspired actually by what I'm seeing communities and municipalities doing. Um, they seem to often be in the lead um, uh, when it comes to actually making things happen. So hi, Olivia, go ahead. Hi, Tanet, thank you. And you, you pronounced my name correctly. Okay. Uh, and thanks so much, Mark. This has been really informative and helpful. I've been taking a ton of notes during this call. So thanks for that. Sure. So yeah, as Tanet said, um, I work for a network of local elected leaders across Canada. And so I was hoping to ask you um, if you could speak on some of those key differences you've observed in communities or municipalities that have transitioned to 100% renewable versus those that have not. Um, if you could speak on um, how can or how have municipalities overcome some of the barriers such as cost and social acceptance? Uh, well, it's a good question, I, but I can't say that too many municipalities have actually converted to 100%. I mean, there are lots of commitments and even policies or laws, like there are in the US, there are 180 cities that have committed to 100%, but the number that have actually converted, maybe one or two. and. Mm. Uh, but I know some that have been trying really hard. So like, okay, I can give an example of Palo Alto, which is right near me. And they've been really thinking about, well, there are a lot of cities in California, for example, that have already banned use of natural gas in new buildings. So they've already banned new construction homes with natural gas. And the whole state, in fact, is thinking of banning natural gas in new buildings in some year pretty uh, in the next five or six years or so. Uh, so that's one th thing that has been, is, has been done is to try to eliminate gas in buildings. And so in the case of Palo Alto, they're also have looked at, well, what are the appliances that people need to do that if they wanna replace their existing, or retrofit their existing homes too. So they've come up with like a list of appliances that are options that people can use for existing homes to replace. And they're not that many when you think about it, you know, you, people use natural gas for uh, home heating, for water heating, air heating, water heating, cooking, maybe a natural gas dryer. So, you know, there are a handful of appliances that use gas. And so the base, and there, but there are already electric alternatives for all of these, like induction, electric induction cooktops, uh, electric heat pump dryers, or just electric, electric dryers in general, uh, and then electric uh, heat pump air heaters and and water heaters all both exist. In fact, I have an air electric heat pump water heater, I have an electric heat pump air heater and air conditioner, I have an electric induction cooktop. So these are existing technologies, um, but the part of transportation is probably a more difficult one because a lot of cities, you know, people drive in and out of the city. So like Paul Alta, I think was thinking of restricting parking to electric vehicles for people who are coming from other cities. Uh, so restricting parking so that you can only park with an electric vehicle. That was one thing. I don't think they've implemented that yet, but that was one idea being floated. So you really need to go through each sector in which energy or emissions are occurring and look at how to address that sector. And so buildings is one, get rid of the gas. That's the main thing. Uh, industry is another, electrify high temperature processes with electric arc furnaces, induction furnaces, resistance furnaces. So in my opinion, the best way to do that is to mandate changes by a certain year. I mean, this renewable, renewable portfolio standards basically, but for not only electricity, but for other energy sectors. So by a given year, we would have all new vehicles have to be electric vehicles, or all new construction has to eliminate gas. By a given year, all existing homes and buildings have to be retrofitted. So they don't use gas. Same thing with industry. That's these renewable portfolio standards seem to be the most effective, not only because they're they're, they're positive. I mean, think of let's say a carbon tax versus a renewable portfolio standard. Nobody wants to pay a tax. That's a very, has a very negative connotation. But you know, most people, in fact, from public opinion polls, over eighty percent of people they love to talk about going to one hundred percent renewable energy. I mean, that's a very positive goal. And it has the same impact as eliminating fossil fuels because you're going to, if you go to 100% renew renewables, you're going to eliminate the same, the source of the fossil sources that you're replacing. 
So yeah, I would propose you make changes in each energy sector, uh, set targets for each year by how much has changed. And that's, I can't say that that's what's being done because every city is doing it differently. Um, but the key is like, I, I think this for cities to be successful, they have to inform the public and you know, give them what is the cost going to be to them. That's what people want to know. And so give them, these are the options. This, these are the te technologies that you can use. And here are the benefits, here are the, either the tax benefits or the savings you're gonna make from energy savings over time. I mean, when you use an electric heat pump instead of a gas heater, you reduce your energy requirements by a factor of four. If it's a ground source heat pump, it's a factor of five compared to burning fuel. So you save a huge amount of money. I mean, I have not paid an electricity bill, a natural gas bill or a gasoline bill in five and a half years and nothing. So even though like the, the price of gasoline now I just looked at it around the corner it was $7.50 a gallon. I mean, you're saving with an electric car, a person will save now $30,000 over 15 years just due to fuel savings alone if they drive an average US average of 15,000 miles a year for 15 years. So that's a huge amount of money. Most people aren't aware of it. Same thing when heat pumps, even if it costs more upfront, you're gonna save huge amounts of money because you're using one fourth the energy. It costs much less. Uh, per unit uh, heating that you're getting compared with natural gas. And natural gas prices have skyrocketed too. So those savings are gonna be in the tens of thousands of dollars too. Mark, can I, can I just wanna jump in on this one? Cause uh, so talk to us about how to do this equitably though. Cause you know, we have a big energy poverty situation in, in Canada and um, so often the rebates that are offered are still really only accessible to people who already have considerable means. Like if you're looking at a rebate for an electric vehicle, for example, you have to by and large be middle to upper middle class uh, to afford it comfortably with the rebate. So, you know, I fear that some of these individual uh, programs um, can can result in greater inequality. Um, well, I wouldn't say greater inequality. I would say inequality, maybe, and but mm -hmm. that that should be remedied. Yeah. By making the so the rebate should be I don't know what the word is progressive. If you're giving greater rebates to lower income, sure. That uh, I mean, the benefits will definitely accrue of the whole of society changing in general of all these laws. The benefits will accrue most to the most disadvantaged people today. Because, for example, in the U.S. in particular, you look at big cities, and that's where most of the pollution is. And most people who are economically disadvantaged, well, those are the people who live near fossil fuel plants where they're near pollution sources. So the exposure to pollution right now is very high for low-income people. And so if everybody collectively, whether they're rich or poor, transitions their energy, the people who will benefit the most from this from a health point of view, and that therefore a health cost point of view, will be low-income people. So we don't want to discourage such a transition because it will benefit the most low-income people. But we also want, when we're doing this transition, we want jobs to go equitably to low-income people. And we want tax credits to benefit low-income people the most. So that's really the responsibility, I think, of the local community or state or country who are setting the tax laws to ensure that these credits uh, get distributed equitably. Uh, but I don't think that that should not be a reason to not do these transitions sure. because mm -hmm. the, the benefits from a social cost point of view just far outweigh the cost. And those benefits will accrue primarily to low-income people and will be huge in comparison mm -hmm. with the energy savings, energy yeah. cost savings. Fair enough. Um, I'm gonna take one of the questions uh, from our audience here. Um, so, and, and I'm sure several people have similar questions. It, it always comes down to the batteries. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, uh, one of the the uh, arguments against uh, wind turbines and uh, 
and solar and battery storage is the minerals uh, that are required to build these things. And, you know, we hear about uh, horrible conditions in which some of these minerals are, are mined. And um, so what, how do we, how do we look at um, the mineral side of things if we're, you know, looking yeah. at it as a circular <coughs> product? I'm well, to finish. Yeah, that's a good question. I'll, I'll first point out that the overall mining required in a 100% clean and renewable energy world is over an order of magnitude less than the current mining that's occurring every year. I mean, as I mentioned, there are 50,000 new oil and gas wells drilled every year in North America, 1.3 million active ones, 3.2 million abandoned ones. You know, there's coal mines that, that have to continuously be dug and storage facilities, et cetera. And on top of that, for the fuel mine, because you're, you're mining for the fuel, these are all just mining for the fuel, not for the infrastructure. We eliminate entirely fuel mining with clean renewable energy. We still have infrastructure mining and which we also have with fossil fuels. So we, by eliminating the fuel mining, you're just, you're eliminating so much mining. Now there is mining remaining, let's say for batteries, we're talking about lithium. So what are the solutions? Well, first of all, since we're going to 100% clean renewable energy world, the actual mining process itself will be 100% renewable. In fact, there are many mines being uh, built or revamped today around the world powered by renewable electricity, wind and solar and hydroelectric. So that's one step. In fact, in Texas, there's a 100% renewable lithium mine being built. And there are others have been either being built or proposed around the world. In the case of lithium, the other thing is that you don't necessarily need mining to mine lithium to get lithium because or additional mining, because for example, there's apparently enough lithium in the Salton Sea alone in California to provide the entire United States with lithium for all purposes. Uh, and right now there are already geothermal electricity wells in the Salton Sea. And these wells bring up brines of, that contain lithium. And instead of actually any new mining, all you have to do is extract the lithium from these brines. And so there's no new mining involved in that at all. Third, all batteries will be recycled. In fact, they are being recycled right now. I mean, so for example, Redwood Materials is a company started by J.B. Straubel, who was the CTO of Tesla. And they, they recycle 95% of the components of the batteries, including the lithium. And when all these components are recycled, then we don't need new mining of those components. So there are many ways to mitigate that problem. In addition, there are some materials that okay, if it's hard to mine them or it's, or it's uh, not very clean, we can use different materials. And, you know, in this um, uh, cobalt is an example. So cobalt is needed for some purposes, but there are other technologies doing the same thing that you don't need cobalt for. And so anyway, there, there, are, just ma there are many options, but recycling is going to be key to minimizing mining. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm wondering if you could clarify uh, your position on hydropower, because we have several questions um, that have appeared. Uh, so what's your position on, on hydro? And is it uh, there a difference between the large hydro and the smaller hydro facilities? Yeah. Well, first, let me define hydro. There's, yeah, there's conventional hydropower where you have a big dam and water behind the dam. And then you have hydropower turbines where the water runs through the turbine to generate electricity. Then there's small hydro called run of the river where you don't have a dam, dam, although you might have a small holding pond or something where there's a turbine just in the flow of the water. And as the water flows through, you generate electricity without stopping the water. And then there's pumped hydropower where you can have two reservoirs, a lower one and an upper one. And when you have excess electricity, you can pump the water up the hill to the upper reservoir. And when you need electricity, you let the water flow down the hill through the generator to generate electricity. In that case, the lower reservoir could be the ocean and the other one could be a lake. Uh, the city of Los Angeles actually proposed the Hoover, Hoover Dam 
to be pumped hydro, make it into pumped hydro, where they would take Lake Mead as the upper reservoir behind Hoover Dam, and then another lake downstream of Hoover Dam would be the lower reservoir, and they'd have underground pipes that would just send water back and forth uh, for pumped hydro. Anyway, my position is we we have, if we have existing hydropower, well, keep in mind, all say in the US, there are about 84,000 dams, but only 3% of them have hydroelectric power on them. So I'm all for closing dams, but you want to close the dams that are not hydropower dams first, and which represents 97% of all dams, like in the US, are not hydropower. So, but we, I think we can use existing hydropower more efficiently today. I'm not advocating new hydropower dams. Uh, and I don't know if we need them at all. And then once we get to 100% renewables and batteries become cheap enough, we can start even dismantling large hydropower dams. I mean, dams are used you know, not only for hydropower, but for water supply and recreation and their other purposes. Uh, but in terms of electricity supply, it's, it's so useful right now for meeting peak electricity demand as well as baseload simultaneously that it would be silly to take them down big dams now, down now, especially when 97% of the dams are not, don't have hydro. Why are you focusing on the one with hydro? But ultimately they could be removed if we can get the system to work efficient, efficiently. Yeah, okay. Um, we're gonna try and squeeze a couple more questions in here and we're aiming to close at um, the quarter past the hour. Um, Louise, if you're there, uh, Louise Como is with the Conservation Council of New Brunswick, and uh, she has done a lot of uh, great work and reports uh, on renewable energy. Hi, Louise. Do you want to hey. ask your question? Yeah. Good evening. Um, so I have a kind of a two-part question for you because we get we have a two-part problem <laughs> to some degree. Um, one of the things I'd really uh, like to have at hand uh, to respond to this counter argument that we get, it's not just the reliability piece that we get, but it's that we are not uh, comparing um, apples to apples in the sense of all in cost. So, you know, you talk about renewables, but you got to overbuild. Um, the renewables need to be connected to batteries, but you're not including the cost of your batteries. They've got to be connected to some hydro, which means you need some transmission. And so when you get in this case in the Atlantic Canada, those are all on the table. Um, when you look at those all in costs, and the argument is uh, relative to all of that, um, we're better off with uh, gas and or SMRs. They're going to be more cost effective. We don't need to do all this other stuff and, and you're not comparis, comparing apples to apples. So I just want to lay that one out there as, as the, the part A of the problem. The part B of the problem is the growing anti-wind campaigns that we have because communities are being bombarded with projects for which they are not, of course, involved in the decision-making around. And I feel like not only am I losing on the all in cost argument, but that this this movement that's growing uh, very rapidly in terms of um, opposing these projects um, will, uh, will just force a default to, we can't build anything anywhere. So we're gonna go to the sites that we already have. We can put a gas plant here, we can put an SMR here. And I just wonder how, how you might assist us in that all in cost issue. Um, and um, also whether your work is really also starting to engage this anti-movement and the social dynamics that we need to address. Yeah, great questions. Well, first, th those people who talk about the all in argument, they're the ones who are not providing all the information because I, when I, I hear this argument as well, and for example, they'll always say when they're trying to say nuclear uh, should be, you, you, when you're comparing nuclear with wind, you have to add batteries to the wind, for example. Well, nuclear needs batteries too. I mean, that, nuclear does not meet the demand for electricity. Nuclear for example, is baseload power in North America. And there's only two countries in the world where it's not baseload power, but even then it doesn't meet the demand. It, meet, it kind of ramps up a little bit, but doesn't meet the demand. So you, need, you do need storage with nuclear power and that storage today or storage or peaking, you need additional peaking power. And that storage is, is often 
uh, natural gas. But that natural gas that you're adding, these are conventional, these are peaker plants. That peaker, like conventional natural gas, which is run as base load, the cost of that natural gas is on the order of six or seven cents a kilowatt hour. Well, a, pe a peaking natural gas plant is on the order of 18 cents a kilowatt hour. So nuclear has to be added with that 18 cents a kilowatt hour natural gas plant, or you can add it with a, with a hydropower. So there really is both wind and solar. Uh, sure, they need to be added with storage to get the overall cost of energy, but so does nuclear. But new, new nuclear, if we're talking about new nuclear, I mean, as I mentioned, it's seven to eight times the cost per unit energy is new wind or solar. Per, that's per unit energy. So when new solar plus storage in, in uh, California is now like, I mean, the solar alone is on the order of three cents a kilowatt hour just for the solar. Same with wind, new onshore wind in, in the United States. The solar plus storage, it goes up to about four or five cents a kilowatt hour. But new natural gas, just the natural gas alone for conventional natural gas is six, seven, six, seven cents a kilowatt hour. So wind and solar are without storage or half the cost of new natural gas. And you can find these numbers in Lazard. They do the levelized cost of energy. When you add storage, you're adding from actual PPAs, solar and storage or wind and storage, you're seeing you know, on the order of four or five cents a kilowatt hour. Um, but it all depends on how much storage you, you put in. Now, so that's based on power purchase agreements. But like when we do modeling, I mean, the overall, the, the cost of energy when I actually combine wind, because we don't do modeling of just wind or just solar alone, we do modeling of the whole system. And the overall levelized cost of energy of a wind, water, solar system, the cost per unit energy is similar maybe in 2050, maybe 10% less than a fossil fuel system. But that's not the cost you really want to look at. You want to look at the annual cost of energy because in a wind, water, solar system, you're using, in Canada, you're using 62% less energy. So even if the cost per unit energy is the same, the overall annual cost people are paying is 62% lower because you're using much less energy. Because yeah, if you're driving an electric vehicle, that's much cheaper than driving a gasoline vehicle. And same thing with driving uh, or heating water using a uh, burning gas for a water heater. Instead of a heat pump water heater, you'd use one fourth the energy. So I'd say the first on the first issue, you have to call their bluff and say, look, you know, you need to when you're talking about nuclear. Nuclear does not peak does not meet the peaking power. Uh, the, sorry, doesn't meet the peaks in demand, and you need storage as well. And the actual cost per unit energy of that nuclear is seven to eight times higher now than new wind or solar. So any way you slice, it's always still going to be cheaper solar for storage. The other question is resistance to growth. You know, I guess this is really a question of what people want. Do they want to solve the problem or not? Do we want, do we want clean air? Do we want clean water? Do we want uh, to reduce climate problems? Do we want energy security? We want more jobs. I mean, overall, worldwide, there are far more renewable energy jobs created than fossil fuel jobs lost if we transition. And so there's the jobs argument, there's the health argument, there's the overall cost argument. The cost of energy goes down significantly, the annual cost, because when we electrify everything. So I think this is really information. We, to, the key is to educate the public about the benefits of a transition. And that, and I think that's really critical because yeah, most people, if they don't, you know, if they're not in, well informed about this, yeah, it's easy for the fossil fuel industry to convince them that, you know, this is going to increase their costs and it cause all sorts of people say, oh, it's going to cause all sorts of noise problems or throw their, throw ice onto their house or something. Wind turbines will throw ice, you know, <laughs> and uh, cause damage. I mean, they'll come up with all sorts of arguments. Um, but it's really an education issue, I think. I think, uh, you know, I'm, it's probably different everywhere. But the, uh, the pushback that I'm seeing on wind farms in particular, I think they're in many cases justified because the company is going in. It's kind of like if Costco or Amazon decided they were moving into your neighborhood and they kind of look around and they say, yeah. 
that looks pretty good. And we're going to, we're going to do it big, you know, and uh, there's no real engagement. Like the word consultation is, has become a synonym for political theater. You know, it's like we go and we give our comments and the people are on their phones, almost ignoring what you're saying. So um, I think, you know, I, I'm really interested in how it can be approached more from an energy democracy um, uh, approach with real community engagement. Um, because otherwise I think we do, we do a disservice to communities. Yeah. Well, yeah, there has to be engagement and often a benefit to the community, either through you know, tax revenues or shared income or um, some other type of incentive for the community to to like this project. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, they, well, definitely the developers should be participating and talking about the benefits in terms of jobs and uh, health benefits. But you know, usually wind farms. I mean, they're going to be best when they're not near houses or buildings because buildings slow down the winds. So most wind farms are in kind of remote areas where they should be. And yeah, yeah and and but I mean, some of the people who who know the land, you know, in in indigenous communities and people who live in rural areas, they know the wildlife corridors and so on, and they right. they want to be able to say, look, sure, let's do wind, but can we move it? A little bit, you know. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, there definitely has to be an engagement. Sixty-four, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, stay tuned, folks. Next month, uh, we're going to have a, a a webinar on energy democracy. So maybe we can get into that a little bit more. Um, I know we're we're already over time, so um, I'm, I I want to leave you with one question here, and that is. I think a lot of people are feeling pretty vulnerable, you know, um, most recently on the East Coast because of Hurricane Fiona. And, um, you know, some communities have been completely decimated. And last uh, year or the year before, I'm losing track on the West Coast, it feels like, you know, so much has, has happened there and everywhere in between. So one of the questions I have is, if we move towards renewables and we have a hurricane or we have a forest fire, it, it, what's going to be standing? Because, um, you know, in one of the uh, solar uh, social media sites, they were sharing pictures of, you know, damaged solar panels and everything. So I think we're all trying to figure out how are we going to survive in this new world well <laughs> one thing is i actually did a study a few years ago what's the impact of large arrays of offshore wind farms on hurricanes and we found and this is down in new orleans and along the east coast of the u.s and we found that large enough arrays will actually dissipate a hurricane sufficiently to minimize storm surge and wind speeds and so in canada you know the hurricane is not going to be so strong as further south because the cooler sea surface temperatures, but you know, the more offshore wind you can build offshore, the more you can actually reduce wind speed, hurricane wind speeds, and storm surge. And so that's one thing I would propose. And it, our plans for Canada require a lot of offshore wind. And now we have floating turbines too that you can put these far enough off that don't bother people's views at all. So you know, that's one aspect. But I would. You know, we're only going to solve this problem if we do if we solve the climate, global climate problems and the damage that is causing wildfires or extreme events, uh, more intense hurricanes, more air pollution, if we transition to renewable energy and get rid of the fossil fuels. As long as we allow the fossil fuels to continue, uh, we will not solve this problem. So I think we only have one choice. The key is how can we implement this renewable energy most efficiently? Certainly, a large share of offshore wind will help mitigate hurricanes as well as uh, provide year-round electricity for our country. Mm. Well, that's great. Um, I really appreciate your time, Mark. And uh, we didn't get to uh, a few of our co-hosts. I'll just name them 
um, Green Majority Radio, uh, a great podcast. I encourage you to listen to it. It's weekly. Um, the Climate Emergency Unit, thank you for being a partner. And the Energy Mix, uh, also a fantastic source of information. And uh, for people who signed up for the call, we'll be sharing a, a recording of this evening's discussion. Um, I know uh, a number of people posted questions, and my apologies that we're not going to to get to so many of them. Um, but I don't want to, um, you know, uh, hog Mark's time. Um, I know you're a very busy guy, and um, so thank you very much. Uh, and I hope we'll have another opportunity uh, yeah, to speak you. like this down the road. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. It's great, okay. great questions all around too. Yeah, great. All right, good night, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Good night.